In the last episode, we learned that I do a terrible job of counting defeats, but we also learned that the LA Kings are for real. We are back in the postseason, a phenomenal run throughout the final few months to lead us to this point. 52 wins in the regular season, a division title, and of course, again, we are back in the playoffs, this time with a little bit more optimism than we had the last time where we snuck in and we got absolutely stomped. And we really don't have to talk about that any further. So let's look ahead to what this series may indeed be. But again, one point, just one point ahead of Calgary again. Still cannot believe that we were able to catch them again. That lead seemed insurmountable. So call it a choke or just call it a hell of a job by our squad to battle back the way that they did. Regardless, though, very happy. Again, we lost out on the top record in the West, technically on tiebreaker, even with Colorado in points. But we smashed all of our goals for the season in terms of the top six putting up points, the rookies doing well, and, of course, making the playoffs. And I am very excited to see what this squad can do. Genther and Savoy stepped in next to Alex Turcotte, who has moved over to center. They were phenomenal. Rasmus Kapari, a lot of people wanted to see him go instead of who we actually ended up getting rid of this past season. But again, using the trade finder, it just so happened that Kapari stayed and he did very, very well next to Kopitar. And Carl Grundstrom, someone else who we were super, super close to trading. Still, you could argue it would have been the right decision to trade him. But regardless, he's still here. He's on this team and he had a really... Really good season for us. Point per game, 23 goals. Excited to see what he continues to do. Alexia Follow took a big hit, dropping from the first line to the third line. But next to Anderson Dolan and the emerging Tyler Madden, the overall might not be spectacular, but we knew by the stats he was probably good enough to be a threat at the NHL level. Indeed, he has been, unlike, say, Akil Thomas, where it didn't really work out. And I love our fourth line. Absolutely love our fourth line. No real surprise there. Hopefully they can keep up that pace in the playoffs. Defensively, the addition of TJ Brody was huge for this team. Again, he's probably only here for the year. Sanderson will rejoin this lineup. Of course, as this defense continues to evolve, unfortunately, with the way medium top four works this year, I mean, Zekoff and Bjorn Fott have kind of capped out already, which sucks, but that's just the way it works, unfortunately. Goaltending wise, though, Carter Hart. We still don't know for sure if he's the long term option here because, again, Yuri Gleboff is there and we're going to have to make that choice eventually. Hart was okay, but in the playoffs, he needs to be great. Time will tell as to whether or not he's able to be great very, very shortly. I'm meant to take a look at the healthy scratches, of course, because we don't have any injuries. We are at 100%. Heading in to this postseason, but Rhymeshaw, Roy, oh, and uh, I was going to say Wah, but it is Matt Roy. And Ingham, of course, are there, and we have options down in the AHL as well, if necessary. So the question is, what does this Coyotes team look like? What are we up against in the first round? Look at the Anaheim Ducks right now with Bergeron on the fourth line. You should be ashamed. This is, oof. Ooh, this is problematic is what this is. We'll go line by line. Nick Schmaltz, he might be, you know, he might be playing like a 90 right now, but he is a second line forward. So we know it's not a legitimate overall, but you can play above expectations. And he has been tremendous, absolutely tremendous for the Coyotes. Year one. He was solid, but the past four years, he has been insanely good. But in the playoffs, he's struggled a bit, so that might help us out quite a bit, make him $5.8 million. He is centered by Clayton Keller, who is a legitimate first-liner, good God. And he has been one of the better players in the league, only one season where he put up less than 94 points in the first five years of this series. But again, a hit or miss sometimes in the playoffs. On the right, a familiar face, Jaden Schwartz, who we knew we weren't going to be able to bring back two years ago. He went to Arizona, had some injury trouble last year, 
But this year, I mean, 63 points, 35 goals. I miss Jaden Schwartz. He was pretty good for us. He was pretty good for us. Second line, we get Taylor Hall, who is down to a second line forward, so he has regressed a bit. Maybe just due to the way that they've handled him, but still capable of an 84-point season. Did resign there five years at about 9.9 .9 remaining. Christian Dvorak on the second line. 50 to 60 point guy. Pretty much now throughout this series. And on the right, Yoel Armia. 5.76 for this season. A third liner might be playing at a higher overall though. Consistent 50 point guy. Damn, he's been pretty good. Hit 20 goals this season as well. Third line, obviously the one that jumped off the page, but it's not a confirmed overall, is Andrew Mangiapane. But he's a depth forward. Question is, how good did he do this year? He had 47 points, so he is probably playing at a higher overall than what he actually is. 2.1 over the next two years. There has been the argument of turn off Fog of War for the playoffs, but you know what? I'm kind of intrigued to just see how it plays out, because it really doesn't matter. I don't know if it does. Baron Hayton, second line forward at this point, playing on the third line, capable of 60-point seasons, back-to-back -back 30 goal seasons. And on his right, Matthew... I think it's Beneers, and if I'm incorrect, I apologize. You know what? Give me... You know what? No. Here, I'll see if I can bring it up in Elite Prospects in, in the meantime. <laughs> While we continue to look at the team. Lawson Krause is there, a fourth liner, capable of 24 points. That's not too bad, of course, for a fourth liner. Centered by Alex Wenberg. It's actually not that much money to have sitting there, but still, uh, you know, to have someone of his talents in the fourth line, first season in Arizona, and on his right is Christian Fisher, also not getting paid that much at this point. So, there you go. I mean, it's not a bad team, you can tell. We don't have the full story right now because of Fog of War, but you can tell it's not that bad of a team. Defensively, it is Oliver ekman Larson and Jacob Chikrin, which, yes, uh, is kind of scary still. Chikrin a legitimate top four. Jordan Oosterle next to Victor Soderstrom, who has developed. That's kind of frustrating that Bjorn Fott hasn't. Third pairing is Matt Benning and Damon Severson. So you know that defense is going to be pretty damn good as well. Ugh, God, who's the goaltender? Auntie Ranta and Jordan Bennington. It's going to be Ranta. Both listed as starters. Ranta in the regular season, a 9-13. But he missed an entire season's worth of play. That's surprising. He played 29 games. In terms of healthy scratches, Dmitry Kalikov, Robert Haig, Ivan Barbashev. They have a really good team. You know, point blank. They have a really good team in terms of the overall. I won't be surprised to see us outmatched for this particular series, unfortunately, uh, with Beniers. Uh, whether or not it's Beniers or not, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, Lee Prospects has nothing up there. I'd have to search YouTube video to find a way to properly pronounce it. So yeah, you know what, it's fine. Regardless, they have a better offense, they have a better defense. We have the advantage in terms of goaltending. Whether or not that's able to translate into wins, time will tell. But a bigger advantage on offense, I think, than I expected but this team has done well all season long in terms of winning when perhaps they shouldn't. We'll see how it works out for us. Playoff hockey for the LA Kings yet again. Let's do this first period and a good start for Arizona. Taylor Hall, the opening goal, nine shots apiece. But they have the difference maker. Second period, we tie it up. Matt Luff scores on Jordan Bennington, so he will be their starter. Second line for the Oats, fourth line for the Kings. I think that sums it up pretty well. 21 shots apiece. Let's go to the third period. This is still anyone's game. Power play for us. It goes to waste. Another power play. That also goes to waste. That scares me. Abbreviated power play for the Oats. Turns into a full power play. They waste it. We're on the power play. We waste it. Under six minutes left. Next goal is going to win but will it come in regulation? Power play for Arizona. We survive. And we go to overtime. That, it, you know, just flat out was incredibly unlikely. 
But we go to OT in game one, somehow, some way. Taylor Hall and Matt Luff with the only two goals of this game. Who's going to take game one? Let's find out. We're not going to jump into it, but predictions? Anze Kopitar is going to win this bad boy. Come on. Let's do this, I believe. Please win. Score for us. For us, please. Power play, please. Oh, my God, we're going to lose. Power play for the outs. There it is. The all Armia ends it. 42 shots to 38, 2 to 1 on the board. We wasted 17,000 power play attempts. Carter Hart did everything he could. Everything he could to keep us in that one. But we just couldn't get the goal. Wow, Matt Luff only played 8 minutes, but he made the most of it. That is incredibly disappointing. How was Savoy a minus player? I guess that first goal. Wasn't a, a power play. But somehow he was the only minus play. You know what? It's fine. What I want to take a look at were all the power play opportunities. Especially in that third period. I mean, incredibly frustrating that we weren't able to take advantage of that. And there was the thought of changing up the power play and the special teams a little bit. And now we have no choice but to do just that. Dylan Genther goes down to injury in his first career playoff game. He is going to be out for over a week, and that might be our playoff hopes and dreams going up in smoke right before our very eyes. That is horrific. I like Rhymesha, but we're probably looking at Fogamo, Shafagulin, or Van Katishin getting the call up. And I mean, Fogamo with that playmaking ability, 85 offensive awareness. Or Shafa with 93 offensive awareness. It's Shafa or Fogama. And I just don't know who. And honestly, it depends on who fits in better on that top line from a chemistry standpoint. We'll see how this goes down. <sighs> That's rough. That is incredibly rough. Feel bad for Ingham. You know what, though? Valalta's hurt. I'm going to send Ingham down, and then that way he can be the AHL backup. Defensively, there's no point in sending down Matt Roy. It'll just piss him off. I still can't believe uh, Mikey Anderson hasn't gone up in terms of role. People are pissed off about Ingham leaving the team, though. Ugh. You know what? It's fine. Hopefully it doesn't mess with team chemistry that much. It might, but you know what? It is what it is. At this point, good. I want you to be upset. You got your asses kicked that last game. I can't afford to piss off Turcotte. Who was Ingham friends with? Hold on. <laughs> that might not have been worth it. Uh, Bjorn fought Luff. Okay, you know what? Ingham's coming back. Screw it. Sorry. Didn't realize it would piss you off that much. In terms of who gets bumped up here, though. Uh, Van Kattishan has gone up to a fourth liner as well. It's not surprising. You can see with how physical he's, he's going to be a third liner or a fourth liner for us next year. We gotta call up Shafa Gulin and Fogamo, which means we gotta piss people off for the moment by sending down Rhymesha, which is fine. He'll get called back up. But right now it's just who fits in on that top line. Let's go best lines there. Uh, and we'll see what we have here. Healthy scratches. Who fits in best? Shafa Gulin or Fogamo? We don't know how well Fogamo fits in. But we do know that Bulat Shafagulin fits in incredibly well. So he's going to get the opportunity over Sam Fogamo. Just like that, we have our answer. So, back to Fogamo. Where is Rhymesha? Bump you up as well. And there we go. We have our moves made. Brutal injury. That we'll see if we have the ability to overcome. And I uh, can't believe I'm saying this, but Bulat Shafagulin is going to get a chance on that top line immediately. Instead of changing up the other lines that we know work, he is going to get that opportunity right out of the gates. And then for the special teams, I mean Shafagulin has been worked in to the equation. The problem is he is not a righty. We're going to want Rasmus Kapari. Can Shafagulin take draws? No, we can't. Regardless... We're going to do this, and then in terms of the lefties who can play center, I mean, it's going to have to be Kopitar. Either that, 
or we put you there. Anderson Dolan ends up playing center. We bump up Kapari here and make that change. Probably put you follow there. We're going to roll with that. As weird as it is, we're going to roll with that. And then for the penalty kill, to be honest, the penalty kill was on point in the last game. I don't think we have to change anything up there. They did a great job. It's just the team couldn't stay out of the box and prevent the Coyotes from getting opportunities. So unfortunately, we had to shuffle up some things with the power play due to the injury to Dylan Genther. Bulat Shafagulin is going to be given an opportunity of a lifetime <clears throat> to try and make himself... A channel legend, although I have to know now what is the overall difference. 98 to 92. Whew. All right. Despite being favorites, our backs were kind of against the wall to begin with. Oh, menu lag. Oh, sweet, beautiful menu lag. How I love you. Jesus, it's so slow. Game two. Let's do this. Let's see how it goes. First period, scoreless. We still have just one goal thus far against Jordan Bennington. That sounds about right, seeing as how uh, we've had examples of how well Jordan Bennington plays in this game in the postseason. Sometimes 15 shots to 6, we could not find the back of the net. Second period, still scoreless. We have one goal through five periods plus half an overtime. 27 shots to 13, but we cannot find a way to beat Jordan Bennington right now. We finally do. Rasmus Kapari, huge goal. Unfortunately, Clayton Keller gets it back three minutes later. Can we beat Bennington again? That is the question. Under seven and a half to go. Tied up at one, crushing them in shots. Yoel Armia scores again. The Coyotes steal it. Back-to-back 2-1 victories for Arizona. Rasmus Kapari's goal wasn't enough. We have two goals through two games. Jordan Bennington playing out of his skull right now. And unfortunately, that's the difference maker. I don't know what it is about Bennington, but it's either in a franchise mode, he is the best goalie in the world, or the worst. And unfortunately, right now, he is proving to be the best. Dylan Genther still, of course, tied for the leading point getter. Shafagulin, I mean, it wasn't necessarily that bad, but I think we have no choice, maybe, but to try and change some things up. I just wouldn't know what. I mean, I think the obvious thing is swapping Shafagulin for Grundstrom, but they're such a good fit. What about Kapari and Savoy? I think we just need our team to score. I gotta be honest. Pretty sure it just comes down to that. We need our team to score. We'll see whether or not they're able to do so. The defense has been on point. The defense and goaltending has been on point. We just haven't been able to score. We are wasting a tremendous opportunity here. I do wonder, yeah, Shafa Gulin's not a good fit on that third line. We're going to give it another opportunity, but obviously we're down 0-2 in this series. Game 3 in Arizona, the unnamed Arizona Arena, because they're affiliated with gambling. Let's see what happens. I mean, we need goals. That's what it comes down to. First period, goals we shall get. And a Merry Christmas to all. Where the hell was that through the first two games? Good God. There's an analogy I could make, but I'm not going to make it. Matt Savoy, Carl Grundstrom, Tyler Madden, Alex Turcott, and Austin Wagner. Five different goal scorers. Five nothing on the board. Jordan Bennington chased in less than 15 minutes. 14.04 to be exact. Damn. That is what we needed. Second period, scoreless. 27 shots to 22. Savoy makes it six off the back of a power play goal. Tyler Madden scores his second of the game. Tobias Bjornfot 
scores. 8 0, 9 0. Alex Turcott on the power play. Are we wasting. And it's double digits. Alex Iafalo. Are we wasting all of our goals in one game? Or is that a sign of things to come? Has the levy broken? 10 0 is your final score. Two five goal periods. A 32-save shutout for Carter Hart, who has been phenomenal through three games and finally gets a win that he so, so deserves. Unbelievable performance. The most dominant, I think, in the history of this channel, the most dominant playoff performance I've ever seen from a team in an individual game. That was beyond one-sided, and Matthew Savoy and Alex Turcotte carried it damn only four players went without a point three of them were defensemen one of them was our fourth line center Valentin Zekoff was a plus five next to Tobias Bjornfot who gets the goal again Carter Hart a 32 save shutouts a Calgary beat Vancouver New Jersey eight, eight to nothing I mean we weren't the only team to get a blowout victory on that day or at least in this postseason, but still to be outscored four to two and then to win ten to nothing is one of the most shocking turn of events I think I've ever seen in a postseason run. As the Ontario Reign are in the postseason, despite only winning thirty-three games and one of their last ten, they somehow sneak into the playoffs. They take on the fifty-win Gulls and win game one three to two in overtime. So there are indeed miracles. How the Ontario Reign made the playoffs, I have no earthly idea. 71 points. I mean, basically the AHL Western Conference was the haves and the have-nots from the looks of it. Absolutely crazy. Speaking of crazy, who knows what kind of craziness will continue here. Game 4, either... The home team will, will uh, lose yet again. Easy for me to say. The home team will lose yet again. That trend will continue. Or we're going to be facing a 3-1 to one deficit heading back to Los Angeles. Let's see what happens. But still, what a moment. A 10 to nothing victory in Game 3. Can we build upon it? First period. Good start for the Kings again. Anze Kopitar, the captain. And Tyler Madden scores again. 11 shots to 9. We're up 2 to nothing on the board. Second period, we add to it Matthew Savoy on the power play. And again, crucial, our power play has been clicking in the last five periods of play since making those changes. We go to the third, up 3 to nothing. Make it 4. Rasmus Kapari scores again. And barring a miracle, we're going to be tied at two games apiece. The home team losing trend is in full effect as Clayton Keller ruins the shutout. First goal on Carter Hart in a long time. As Jaden Schwartz adds another one. Is it too little, too late? Alex Turcotte's empty netter says yes it is. Barrett Hayton gets one back. Out of nowhere, 5-3 is the final score. A disappointing final you know, eight minutes or so there for Carter Hart, but ultimately we get the win. Uh, disrespectful to our team to only have one star in the mix. But again, the home team trend is alive and well. The question is whether or not now we can break that streak. It's Drew Doughty and TJ Brody had a pretty rough game. Toby Bjorn fought, had a great game. Carter Hart still had a really good game. It just got away from him at the end of it. But regardless, we walk away with the victory 15-3. to as compared to their 4-2 to two deficit after the first two games at home, Matt Vivalta is back. We're just going to go best lines down in the AHL. This is anybody's game at this point. Uh, Bulat Shafagulin, two points in three games, has fit in quite well as Turcotte and Savoy have just decided to go off. The second line's been strong. The third line, you know, Tyler Madden's done well. I mean, it's just we got off to such a slow start at home. Again, that home ice curse 
seemingly in effect. That third pairing has been spectacular. Let's just jump into it. We have no idea. My best Philip DeFranco impression there. We have no idea what's going to happen until we hit the button, so let's just do it. It's game five. Let's see what happens. What version of our team is going to show up? Is home ice going to continue to be a curse throughout this series? Here we go. First period, goal apiece. So a slower start compared to what we had seen in the past few games. Turcotte, though, still scores on the power play. Uh, power play, again, still firing on all cylinders. Jaden Schwartz, though, able to get the goal back. We had the slight edge in shots. Second period, Arizona with the lead for the first time in a while. Nick Schmaltz gets, I believe, his first goal of this postseason. And we're now in a little bit of trouble. 2-1 to one advantage for the Yotes as we go to the third. Right now, home ice not looking too good for us here, unfortunately. Power play for Arizona goes to waste. We still have life, and now we have a shot. Alex Turcotte ties this game. Over 40 shots allowed. Power play for the Kings. Come on, come on, damn it. Three minutes left. Two, one. Are we going to overtime? Yes. <sighs> yes, we are. I only jump in the games if they're an elimination game, unless it's in the Stanley Cup final, in which case any game that goes to overtime will watch. I really do want to jump in to watch this, but you know what? For the sake of time... Here we go. Not going to make a prediction, but this could be the series. Who is going to go to Arizona up 3-2 to two with a chance to end it? Here we go. And the answer is Arizona. Lawson Kraus, 12 seconds into the overtime. The fourth liner scores. And that's why I was tempted to jump in. Damn it. The home team has lost all five games to start this series. Hart was phenomenal, Bennington was great, Turcotte was great, but it was not enough. Ultimately, only four players with points. Brody and Doughty are really dropping the ball. The top line, our five top players, by definition, top line and top pairing, drop the ball in a big time way. And we now face elimination because of it. We need to win two in a row. You know, Terry O'Rain going to five games against San Diego. The question is, again, just what to do. I don't think there's anything that can be done. It's just this team needs to succeed. And again, like, Pareko and Clegg have been so good all season long, I'm not breaking them up. It's up to Brody and Doughty. Although I am going to make Clegg and Pareko the top pairing. I think that's the difference. I'm not going to drop Savoy and Turcotte's line with Shafagulin just because of one rough game. Carter Hart, you've been great. Absolutely phenomenal. And this is going to be a travesty of justice if you don't make it out of the first round. But you have proven yourself to be, I think, our number one. And actually, I stand corrected. The Ontario Reign... Pulling off one of the crazier upsets I've ever seen. They sweep the San Diego Gulls. Two overtime wins to do so. I, that's a that's a whole different mind. Uh, uh, let's go with the term mind fuck, whatever. Uh, that, is, that is its own different situation. Game six, though, we focus on the task at hand. Here we go. Let's do this. First period, scoreless. We need the home team losing trend to continue for one more game. 14 shots to 9 in their favor. Second period, Arizona with the lead. Christian Dvorak and Yola Maria. 31 shots to 13. And it looks like the LA Kings have run out of gas. Power play goes to waste. We need quick goals here. But I think Jordan Bennington and the Oats just going to be too much to overcome. Tyler Madden scores. We're back within one. Seven minutes to go here. Is there a late goal? There is not. Yoel Armia is going to seal the deal. The Arizona Coyotes win this series in six games. 
Jordan Bennington play his lights out. The loss of Dylan Genther, perhaps too much to overcome in what goes down as a very, very disappointing season for us. The top line struggled in that elimination game. Maybe we should have broken them up. Shafa Gulin was okay. But again, offensively, while Terracott and Savoy were on point, defensively they were shaky. Grundstrom was fine. Uh, Kopitar was fine. Kapari was fine. Yafala was all right. Anderson Dolan and Madden were all right. We didn't get much offense out of the fourth line, but they were okay. It's just in general, I, I don't know. It's it's tough to say what the issue was. Brody and Dowdy fell apart. That's the biggest issue. Our two best defensemen fell apart. You know, as decent as they looked, once the acquisition happened, they just fell apart. I mean, the big issue here, no goals, 5-3, 1, 1, 2, 1. I mean, <sighs> that is so disappointing for Carter Hart. <clears throat> it's, it's tough to label one problem in particular. I think, really, it was just an unfortunate luck of the draw. It's the only way I can really label it. But we are bounced in the first round of the playoffs by the Arizona Coyotes. The Yotes put up the fewest amount of goals for in the first round thus far, yet they still beat us. That is essentially the definition of bad luck. Although it is kind of inflated. They only scored one power play goal. Again, our defense and penalty kill was on point. Yet somehow, some way, we choked away that opportunity. That'll do it for this one, guys. I thank you for watching. You know the deal. Support the video. Support the channel. Check out everything in the description. And a shout out to my patrons on Patreon. I love you. Another very interesting off-season lies ahead.